invite you to sing with us. Come on, y'all. He's coming on the cloud. Every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Cause our God is the light, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Cause our God is Took a breath, you 
breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me
the darkest night it still goes on the anthem of my God within my heart is a treasure that cannot be bought when all else is faded it will not the presence of my
our Father everlasting, the all creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Good morning and welcome to the Grace Church. I'm Andrew Farley. So glad you are joining us today. I am in West Texas at our Lubbock campus today, but I'm excited to join you via technology in Dallas. And of course, we welcome our online audience as well. 
Remember, if you're supporting the Grace Church and we are supported by supporters just like you, well, remember, you can designate your gift online. When you go to thegracechurch.org, you can designate for West Texas or Dallas or online. And there are so many ways to give. You can text to give. You can also see the QR code right there on your screen. You can give in one of our lobbies in Dallas or Lubbock. And of course, again, on our website. We thank you so much for your support. We cannot do what we do without you. And we've had so many exciting things happen this past year. And in this coming year, we've got new opportunities with online coaching and counseling, new languages that we're going to be offering the grace message in, and so many good things to come. So stay tuned and just thank you. We are grateful for your support. Well, why don't we open with a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this time. We love gathering together in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you would minister to us today. Show us your truth. Help us understand this radical reality of being alive with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we are continuing our series today, and it's called Alive with Christ, Discovering Our Spiritual Riches in Ephesians. We're now in chapter 2. If you remember last week, we dove into chapter 2 just a little bit, and so we're going to revisit some of those verses and then continue on, and we will finish the chapter today. Ephesians chapter 2 is one of the most powerful passages in all of the New Testament. It has so much goodness, and I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. We begin in verse 1. It says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So it's not that you were just misbehaving. It's not just that you were lying and cheating and stealing and misbehaving badly and not going to church enough and not reading your Bible and not being a good person. No, the reality of our condition is that we were dead. So this is not very politically correct, is it? I mean, the political correctness message out there says you just got a bit of a problem. It's not a big deal. All you need is a bit of education. All you need is a better vocabulary. All you need is to take this sensitivity course. All you need is to change the way you're talking and change the way you're acting. But God is saying, wait, no, uh, let's pump the brakes here. Let's hit the pause button. Let's look a little deeper because you're only talking about symptoms. You're just addressing things with a Band-Aid. There's a deeper wound. There's a more serious problem, and that is you're dead. And until we understand our problem, we're not really going to understand the solution that God has given us. Because real Christianity is not turning over a new leaf. Real Christianity is not trying your best to be churchy and be religious and be different. Real Christianity is like when you die and wake up the next day a brand new person. Real Christianity is like when you're on the side of the road, you've died of a heart attack, and then they show up with the paddles, and they lay those paddles on your chest, and they plug them in, and they hit you with an electric shock, and boom, resurrection life. There you are, alive again. That's what real Christianity is. So if we can understand the problem, then we're going to understand the solution a whole lot better. And Paul starts out this chapter saying, you were dead and you also had a location problem. You were in sin. So put all that together, dead in sin, and then now alive with Christ. Do you see it? We got to get it. That's the contrast. And when we wrap our minds around what God has really done in the gospel, then everything becomes a whole lot easier. Temptation hits, and you know you're alive with Christ. That sinful thought comes down the hallway of your mind, and you know you're dead to sin and alive to God. All right, verse 2 says this, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. All right, so he's saying you were a child of Satan. I mean, not very popular, but he's saying it. And, you know, we think of Satan as a red horned devil who's up in heaven or down in hell or all over the earth, you know, begging God to tempt us or down in hell mocking people or all over the earth sending us bad thoughts with a pitchfork in his hand trying to get everybody to be bad. Now, maybe we need a little better view of the enemy. I mean, first of all, He's a liar. Second of all, he would love for you to be religious. He's a liar and he would love for you to engage in a self-improvement program, a religious reform program. He loves that. Nothing thrills him more than when the church gets entirely distracted and we miss the hope and the power of the gospel and we exchange it for something else. I mean, you know what? The law is always looking for a boyfriend, and it's easy to find one in church, if you know what I'm saying. So this is what it means to be flirting with Moses and missing out on Jesus, cheating on Jesus by flirting with the law, and the enemy loves it. So let's blow up our view of Satan and realize he's more than some horned devil with a pitchfork. He is absolutely interested in legalism. He would love for you to adopt the doctrine of demons, and he would love for you to be distracted by Christianese and Bible Belt religion and all kinds of religious jargon. So that's why we do what we do, diving into the Word of God to see how good it really is because it's way better than you might imagine. And the enemy doesn't want you to see it. But don't worry, greater is he who is in you, and you're going to see it because God is going to make certain that you see it. Verse 3, among them we too, even we Jews, yes, even Paul, yes, even Saul of Tarsus, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So notice again, it was a nature problem. And notice again, it was a location problem. In the flesh, formerly you lived in sin, you were dead in sin, and you were living in the lusts of your flesh. So when we say today, hey, you're not the flesh, you don't need to identify yourself according to the flesh. You don't need to talk about my flesh as if you own it. This is the kind of thing we're referring to. Remember, that's who you were, and that's where you were in. You were in the lusts of your flesh. Now you're in Christ. So identify yourself according to your location. Location, location, location. Just like the realtors say, it's a really big deal. And it determines the the sense of value and worth that you have. A piece of property on lakefront, a piece of property on the beach is way better, right? Well, your location is you got the best seat in the house. You're in Christ at the right hand of God. And wow, that means you're valuable. You're worth something. In fact, it's beyond measure. You can't even comprehend what your father thinks of you. Now, verse 4, he says, but God, being rich in mercy, you know, when you were stuck in your condition, God was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So everything he's about to tell you is motivated by love. He, He fixed the problem. You had this issue. It was death and it was your location in sin and you were in the lusts of the flesh and now he loved you enough to fix the problem. How did he fix it? Well, next he tells us. Here it is. And when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. All right, the theme of our entire series, alive together with Christ. So, 
Don't miss all of this. I mean, first of all, what is Christianity? Christianity is not a behavior improvement program. It's being made alive. Christianity is not a a self-improvement, behavior improvement, reform, turn over a new leaf, try harder, do better, do more, rededicate, recommit. No, real Christianity is you're made alive. Now, what about the together with Christ? Because that's a pretty big deal. Remember, remember that measly message. It's all over the place. It's popular. You're going to hear it everywhere. The measly message that you need to get closer to God. And here's how you do it. If you'll just read your Bible, pray every day, have your quiet time, go to church, make sure you're being discipled, get in a small group, have a good prayer life, be a good person, try harder, rededicate, recommit. God's in love with a future version of you that is doing more. So shoot for that goal and you'll get closer to God along the way. Now, I say all that tongue-in-cheek, but is it really an exaggeration? We are inundated, we are saturated with a popular message of getting closer to God. Now, Paul is taking that measly message, and he is saying there's something way better, way more powerful, there's something beyond your wildest dreams, and that is that you are not only close to God, you're alive Together with Christ, you are bonded and fused and merged as one vine and branches in him, and he's in you. The glory that you have given to me, Father, I have given to them, Jesus says, that they may be one just as we are one, Jesus says. And that prayer, well, it got answered. It got answered through the gospel. It was answered through the cross and resurrection. And you, as a result, are not getting closer to God. We are not going to settle for that measly message. We're not going to settle for less. We're shooting for the stars. We want to understand the spiritual riches that we have in Christ. We're not going to settle for less. And so I will never, you will never hear me teaching over decades and decades of preaching and teaching You will never hear me saying that you need to get closer to God. I would never say that. Why not? Because there's a greater truth and we're not going to settle. Because there's a spiritual reality and something has already happened. When the God of the universe makes you close, you're really close. When the God of the universe accomplishes something, he does it perfectly. And when you are in union with Christ, it is as close as you can possibly get. You've been made alive together with Jesus. Amen? So what are we doing begging and pleading and hoping and waiting and preaching to others to try to get them to achieve what Jesus has already accomplished? It doesn't make any sense. So what we need to do, what is a true act of faith, is when we count ourselves alive to God. Do you hear that? That's a decision. Now, it doesn't change the fact. You are one with Jesus. Like it or not, it's too late. Sorry about that. You're as close to God as you'll ever be. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You got the vine and branches. It's too late. You're perfectly clean and close. But there's a decision you can make. What is it? Agree with God about it. Just believe him. Just enjoy it. Just count on it. Count yourself alive to God. And so that's what Paul is urging the church to do. And if he were here today, in a sense, through the scripture, he is telling us today to count on it. Just believe it. It's this good. So you can not believe it and be miserable and flounder and just flop all around throughout your life trying to inch closer through who knows what method, or or you can count yourself alive and just enjoy Christianity to the fullest as you are one with Jesus. Amen. Isn't that awesome? All right. Well, here's verse six. It it gets even better. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
All right, so again, we already saw alive together with Christ. I mean, how good was that? Can you get any closer? You're alive and you're fused and you're bonded. Now, if you want another image, don't worry. Paul's got it for you. It's like he picked you up. God picked you up. He took those prongs and he pulled you out of the flesh. He pulled you out of Adam. He pulled you out of sin and he transferred you over here and he put you in Christ. Christ in the spirit, in righteousness, so that you could be born of God. So he's given you two ways to look at it. You were made alive together with Christ, or you were raised and seated in heavenly places right next to God in Jesus. No matter how you want to look at it, it's plain and obvious what he's saying. You're clean and you're close and you're right and you're one, and it's unshakable, and it's unbreakable. And then we say, oh, yeah, 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 I love my position in Christ. It is good positional truth. No, it's just truth. So don't let anybody fool you. Everybody is somewhere spiritually, right? Every single person in this room and watching online, every person is somewhere spiritually, Now, it's not positional, it's just factual. (laughs) It's not uh, positional truth, it's just reality. You are in Adam and dead, or you are in Christ and alive. And both of those are realities. It's a reality for the sinner, and it's a reality for the saint. And there's no funny business, there's no category or bin where we put that truth and just call it uh, positional. It's just plain factual. It's reality. So don't water it down. Don't put it in some category. Don't toss it in a trash bin of theological truth. It's just true. You are in Jesus and you're as close as you can possibly get to God. Now, he goes on in verse 7. He says, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We talked about this last week. This was the final verse we touched on, and God is a show-off. In the best way, in the only way that he can do it, uh, with humility and yet with pizzazz, God wants to show off the riches that are in Jesus. And so that's what Paul is telling us. He did all this so that he could show off his kindness toward you. He took you out of Adam. He put you in Christ. He crucified you, buried you, raised you, and then seated you at his right hand. And now he's got his arm extended. He's saying, look at all my kindness. Look at everything I've done for you. I love you so much. I just want to show you my goodness. I want you to participate in my love. I want you to see my smile. I want you to sense my delight. And I want you to brag on my son, Jesus. I mean, that's what this verse is really about. The surpassing riches of his grace and the kindness of God. He did everything that he did in order to show off who Jesus is to you and me. All right, now we're diving into new territory. Verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, could it get any plainer? I guess we'll have to ask the Catholics. Could it get any plainer? I mean, I guess we'll have to ask the Mormons. Could it get any plainer? We're going to have to ask the legalists worldwide because here it is, staring them in the face, salvation by grace through faith. It's not progressive. You're not working on it. You're not giving it your best shot. It's not a wait and see situation. You don't get to heaven and then hope God grades on a curve. You don't find out later. You're not taken by surprise. John says, I write you these things so that you may know 
that you have eternal life. You right here, right now, this morning, sitting in that chair, you can know that you have eternal life. There's no guesswork to it. It's as simple as this. You either want to be saved or you don't want to be saved. And anybody that wants to be saved by Jesus, he's already told us he's at that door. You don't have to invite him over to your house. He's already at the door. You don't have to hope that he shows up. He's already on the doorstep. And all you do is turn the doorknob. You know, like Rahab did in the Old Testament. She turned the doorknob and the spies came in. Well, by faith, you're turning the doorknob and saying, Jesus, I want you. I want you to save me. I want you to come into my life. And it's as easy as that. By grace, you are saved through faith. It's not anything you can do. It's a response to what he has done. He did everything. I mean, you're just sitting there. All he did, though, was what? Come as a human, live 33 years, be tortured and killed, rise from the dead, ascend to the Father, and then say, you want me, you got me. And now you get the easy part. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. You get the easy part. So salvation is easy. It's easy believism. Remember, people toss stones at that idea. They mock it. Oh, you don't want to listen to that. That's that, yeah, that's that easy believism stuff. Well, Jesus said it's easy and light, and he said whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So it is easy. It's supposed to be easy. That's why it's a narrow gate, and so many people miss it because they're making it hard. The easy is the narrow. The narrow is the gate of grace. The wide gate is a gate of self-improvement. The narrow gate is the gate of grace. All right, so he goes on in verse 9. He says, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. There's no bragging. Look at me and my dedication. We got a flavor of the gospel out there today that basically says, uh, you made Jesus Savior, but did you make him Lord? Did you really, you know, dedicate yourself and commit yourself? Are you really sold out? How much did you surrender? And see, if that were part of the formula, you surrendering enough, you dedicating enough, you committing enough, Lord, look at me, I promise I'll never do this again. I'm going to repent of everything right now. You'll never see me sinning again, Lord. No, 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 sir. If, if that were what saves you, then you'd have something to brag about. Look at me and how sold out I am. Look at me and how surrendered I am. But what Paul is saying is, no, nope, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. So nobody can boast. All right, verse 10, one of my favorite verses. You're going to love this one. Look what he says. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Oh, Lord, we are bad, Lord. I remember hearing about a, an event with a thousand or more people in attendance, a big event, a popular Christian teacher, pastor, author, speaker. He stood up in front of the crowd and announced in prayer, God we are bad, but you are good. Now, at first glance, that sounds really humble, doesn't it? Lord, we stink. Lord, we're dirty worms. Lord, you're holy and awesome, but we're awful and we're wicked. Now, if that's humility to you, hang on because we got a better view of humility coming up. Real humility is saying exactly what God says about you. No more and no less. Do you hear that? Real humility is saying what God says, not what religion says, not what the Bible Belt says, but what God says is real humility. All right, so what does God say? Well, he says it right here, doesn't he? What did it say? What did we read? It said that you are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, if you're designed to fly, what are you? You're an airplane. If you're designed to drive along America's highways, what are you? You're a motorcycle or an automobile of some kind. You know, when somebody tells you your purpose, 
then you can uh, infer something about your design. Now, the Apostle Paul has told us our purpose. He says that we've been prepared for good works, that we are a workmanship, a master craftsmanship of God for the purpose of good works. So what does that say about you? Are you bad? Did God create you bad so that you'd do good? Now, that would be an idiotic move, wouldn't it? I mean, the the God of the universe, the master architect of everything we see, says, I want Joel and I want Lisa and I want John to walk in good works. Therefore, here's an idea. I'm going to create them with a wicked heart. I'm going to create them with an evil, sinful nature. I'm going to create them as two people, a good you and a bad you. And then they're going to walk in good work. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, that's foolishness. That's an exercise in futility. So what we're reading here is that God has a purpose for your life as a believer. And don't worry, he's already equipped you for it. So how did he equip you? By making you good. A lot of Christians won't say that. Will you say that this morning? I am good. Will you say that this afternoon and this evening? I am good. What about tomorrow when temptation hits and you get all the nasty thoughts? Will you say it? I am good. Because a lot of people, we think that's sacrilegious. We think that it's uh, an insult to God, that it's a lack of humility. But I'm telling you, you're a good tree. And Jesus said only a good tree could bear good fruit. And Paul is saying you can bear good fruit because you're created for good works. So what does that make you? It makes you a good tree. You got a good nature. You got a good heart. You're a good person in Christ. So don't be fooled because, you know, we're mocking the world all the time. We're saying, can you believe that world? I mean, they're so insane. They think they're good. They don't know that they're inherently sinful. Can you believe that world? They're just running around saying they're mostly good. They're a bunch of liars. They don't know what they're talking about because they're bad. All right, you're right about that. But then are you going to get saved and then say the same thing? Say the same thing about yourself, that you're bad? Did God change anything? Did anything get born again? Did anything come up out of that tomb as you were raised to newness of life? When God gave you a new heart, didn't that change who you are? When he gave you a new self and a new nature, doesn't that matter? Will you start believing that you're good? I'm going to make it as simple as Sunday school. I'm talking for second graders. If you're good and the bad thought comes, then you can say, I'm good. No, thank you. I don't want that bad thought because I'm good. Now, if you're bad and the bad thought comes, you're doomed because bad people do bad stuff. So if you've ever wondered how this message of identity really works, here it is. When the bad thought comes, you say, I'm good. When the sinful thought comes, you say, I'm righteous. When the bad thought comes, you say, I'm dead to it because I'm good and I'm good with my God. Do you see how simple that is? But if we're going to buy the religious lie that we're bad, then we've got no hope because we're going to have to do, have to do that bad thought, have to do that bad idea, that bad sinful notion is going to take us captive because we're bad and we believe we're bad. But through the gospel, God has done something good. God is good, and he made you good, and now he's given you good things to do. And it all makes sense, because look at you. You're new-hearted, and you're good-hearted. You're new-natured, and you're good-natured. And that's the truth about you. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. All right, that's a lot to swallow, but just take this in. He's talking about the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Ephesians, and he's saying, just remember, 
You didn't have any hope. Before this message, you got nothing. Zero. Zilch. So, honestly, you're lucky to be here. That's what he's saying. We Jews, eh, we knew this was coming. But you Gentiles, you're lucky to be here. (laughs) So this is his perspective as he begins this monologue, this diatribe on the Jew-Gentile situation. Now, in verse 12, he says, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. All right, so this is it. It's the new covenant or nothing. That's what he's saying. You can't go back to something if you didn't have anything to go back to. What are you going to go back to, Ephesians? You had no hope, no covenant, no God, no future, no nothing. You were strangers to all the covenant. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were out. And now you have an opportunity. You've been invited in. So what are you going to go back to? You got nothing back there. No history with Yahweh. So he's laying it on the line. And folks, this is why it's so silly that today we Americans, we Canadians, we Mexicans, you name it, we Australians, we British, we Africans, we Asians, it's ridiculous that we are saying, well, maybe we need a balance of law and grace. You know, the new covenant and the old covenant together as a balance foolishness because we never had the old covenant. We were never invited to the law to begin with. So for us as non-Jews, for us, it is the new covenant or nothing at all. We got nothing to go back to. So the idea of balance or mixing law and grace is absolute foolishness for the Gentile. It's the new or it's nothing. Verse 13, but now in Christ, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now compare that to the idea of getting closer to God. See, we think it's progressive. We go by our emotions. We go by our feelings. But Paul is saying, no, it's the blood. It's the blood of Christ that brought you near. And you Gentiles, that's most of the planet, you were far off with no hope. And the blood of Jesus is what brought you close. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. What are the two groups? He says both groups brought in as one. What are the two groups? You got the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, little insight into predestination here. You're looking at it. You're looking at it. This is the true meaning of predestination. It's not about God going down the city street saying, you but not you, and I'm picking you for the team, but you're, not, you're off the team. You were never a good player. I got a bad feeling about you. Ooh, I like the way you look at me. Yeah, you're in. It's not random selection of individuals to get saved. Predestination is exactly what we're reading right here in Ephesians. The two groups God predestined, the two groups to come together as one. This is so powerful and so unifying and so very awesome. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, Jews and Gentiles, into one new man, thus establishing peace And verse 16, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it, having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. All right, who's near? The Jews were near. Who's far away? 
The Gentiles were far away. He preached to both groups. He brought them together. He tears down the law as the wall between them. There's no distinction, no favoritism. Everybody's invited. Come on in. It's like the wedding feast. They couldn't get anybody to show up. So Jesus tells the parable. He says, go out into the streets and ask anybody that you see. Tell them, come on in to the party and celebrate. What a beautiful picture that unifies us, brings us together, tearing down the walls of racism and division, inviting all of us. God is saying, you and you and you, and there's no partiality. Now, he finishes out this passage. He says, for through him, we both, Jew and Gentile, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, so then you Ephesians are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. They've got hope. They've got an invitation. They had nothing. They were out and now they're in. Paul is saying, let's do this. The Jews come in. The Gentiles come in. We're one in Christ. We're loving each other. We're unified. We recognize not just our identity as individuals, but now we see we're being built together as a house of God, a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We're the Ark of the Covenant. We're the Holy of Holies. We're in And he's in us, and we can behold his glory, and we can see that glory transforming us from the outside in with new thoughts and new perspectives. This God who lives in our hearts by faith has come, and he's changed everything, and he's brought us together, and there's a new way to see ourselves and a new way to see each other. Wow. We're not inching close to God anymore. No more self-improvement religion. We've got it better than all that. We don't have to settle for the measly message of self-improvement. We can see it. We're born of God and we're built now for good works with a good heart, a new heart, a good nature, a new nature, a new self that is good just like our God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this truth, this powerful truth, that we don't have to put on airs and self-improve and try to be rule keepers and measure each other. We're in. We're in the room of grace. We're dancing and delighting in this gospel together with you, you who delight in us. We thank you for your love and your grace and your forgiveness and your kindness. We love it that you're showing off for us every day as we get to know the riches that are in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.